Hey guys, Nathan Ducker of Honey. This is number six in my vlog series on building a bee business. Just going week by week and uh, talking about some of the struggles, some of the things I'm doing, and what I'm thinking, also answering questions from viewers. So this week has been busy, um, <laughs> and not always busy in the right ways. Um, I was driving by my honey house two days ago, and I've got a yard hydrant there for a hose and I, I was driving by and it was you know 10 11 o'clock in the morning so it had been really cold we had a sort of an unexpected late freeze got down in the low 20s and I had not um, I'd not weatherproofed everything I'd left that yard hydrant on and it burst so by the time it warmed up it had it had cracked the the actual head on the faucet and it was spewing water out so I, I was driving by and like hmm well that's not good <laughs> and I had to turn the uh, water off at the meter and my sister's house is on that meter so I turned the water off to her entire house luckily she was at work and I was able to get a new uh, faucet in town uh, the, yard, the hardware store in town had one so I just pulled the guts out of the old one and uh, you know there's a, a stem and a seat and uh, the head and, and all that and replaced it with the guts from the new one and that worked so I didn't have to dig anything up didn't have to replumb it it's just a you know, it's just a hundred and six dollar mistake for me being dumb so I don't like paying stupid tax and I tend to do that more than I would I would prefer. So yesterday I started grafting. Uh, I got 45 cups grafted out of a queen I really like. Got my builder set up and uh, we've got some tough weather coming up. It's The temperature is dropping all day today. This is Friday. Um, I think the low tonight's 28. The low tomorrow is like 20 and then 19 and then 24. Um, so it's gonna be a while before the bees are out and flying again. And I was picking up some of my hives yesterday and just thought, oh man, they're way too light. Uh, they're brooding up a lot. They're just living hand to mouth right now. Everything they bring in, they're putting into brood. So I ordered some more Hive Alive fondant um, because you know if it comes in and by monday or so i'll probably go slap that on some of the light ones i also open fed some heavy syrup hopefully they'll be able to get out and get some of that i did not have time to do everything i didn't have time to put feeders in and and do what i really wanted to do and i didn't have fun and available or i would have slapped some in yesterday so that's got me concerned um man it it, it really does it's got me concerned I did find two hives with swarm cells in them yesterday. There weren't a lot of them though. I don't know if they're trying to pull a super procedure or if they're actually trying to swarm. Uh, they were both big colonies though. One of them was the one I set up to use as my cell builder. So I sort of look at that like a good thing. Um, you know, I, the queen is not in the bottom anymore. They're queenless and they're trying to swarm on me. So. You know, if I didn't screw up the grafting too bad, they ought to make pretty good queens. I went ahead and fed them, got a pollen patty in them and some syrup. Got a pollen patty in almost everybody yesterday because I do not know what this weather is gonna do to the bloom. Um, man, I, I really didn't want a late freeze, especially a hard freeze. We're supposed to have like 19 degrees one night. Uh, you know, mid twenties, um, sap's got so much sugar in it that it acts like an antifreeze but when you start getting down into the teens uh, that's that's tough on the bloom so you know fingers crossed it doesn't set us back too much i can i can feed you know if it does set us back but right now i just um, i need to keep my colonies from starving over the next couple weeks and then uh, reassess I got my first test run of wax dipping done this week. I got, uh, I don't know, 35 boxes or so done before I had a boil over. And uh, that's something I knew to look out for. There's a, a document that um, the Australian Rural Development or some, you know, it's like their USDA, I guess, uh, whatever the acronym is for that, they put out and it talks about boil overs. 
Uh, there's a few reasons that that can happen. It's usually you either overheat the wax um, or um, you're putting too much wood in at a time or there's too much moisture in that wood. And it can be a combination of all three. So I had 10 medium boxes in there when I saw the level starting to rise pretty quick. So I cut all the flame off, uh, cut the tanks off, had everything off. And I do have a spillway around the lip of the tank because I knew that this is an issue. And it, uh, it actually got into the spillway so much that it overflowed the spillway. Now, when I gave my drawing, I, I think it was like on the back of a napkin or maybe a post-it note to my friend who works at the welding shop to build this thing, I actually had a spout coming off of it so that I could hang a metal bucket on that spout. Well, that spout didn't get built in the, in the uh, finished product, so um, I had to cut a hole in the spillway and uh, I had some two inch uh, tube, I think it's eighth inch wall, might be, a little, might be a little bit bigger than that, I'm not sure. But I got that put on and welded and uh, you know, I had to die grind it down. It's such a pain to do that stuff. So I'm not sure that that two inch uh, outlet is going to be as big as I would like for it to be, but the only other material I had was like a two by six um, rectangle tube. And I thought that was gonna be way too big uh, because 18 inches or two foot of that was just really heavy. I didn't wanna hang it off of that uh, angle iron spillway and I didn't wanna have to build a brace for it. So we're gonna test this and see if that works. and. Um, Try not to overload the tank in the future. It's also got me thinking about um, equalizing the wood or allowing the wood to adjust. Like once I get the honey house done, I've got the ability to control humidity in there. So if I could just stick a pallet of boxes or two pallets of boxes in the end of the honey house and then suck the moisture down to 30% for a week before putting them in the dip tank, I think that would probably really really help that. So I ran out of space, had to get the tractor back in the canopy, under the canopy where the, um, uh, where the wax dip tank is. So I left a pallet of wax dip boxes out in the rain and man, water beads up on them just like it does on a waxed car hood. It's pretty cool, uh, really pretty cool. I guess the next 10 years will tell me whether this is worth it or not. <laughs> I, I certainly hope it is with the investment I've got into this whole thing. So over the next week or two, um, what I've got coming up, I won't know if my grafting was successful until Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday next week. Um, I just don't have the weather to go peak and see what my take looks like. I would love to, but um, I just don't have the weather for it. So I'm just gonna be patient Next week, I need to get through my hives. Um, I have thrown a lot of drawn combs at hives to keep to slow them, slow them down from swarming, give them room to expand. And bees like to move up more than they like to move out. So I've got four boxes on a lot of hives with brood in every one of them, but it's in a column right in the center, like a chimney. And there's empty combs on the outside that they're just not utilizing. So. What I would like to do next week is to go through my hives pretty thoroughly, uh, look for swarm cells, knock those down. If I find any, maybe do some emergency splits if I have to. Um, that sort of depends on how my graft take looks like. Um, you know, whether I'm gonna be able to be successful rearing queens through this weather and everything on the first round, we'll see. But I'd like to go through those hives and basically spread the brood out, uh, cycle the undrawn combs into the center of the boxes, uh, push brood down in the hive, down to uh, the first and second box, and just make better use where I can put some of that uh, empty comb back on top of the hives, push brood down to the bottom. That should buy me a little bit of time before I have to split them. And that's, that's what I'm trying to do right now is just the big hives that look swarmy, I need to slow them down until I can get some queens ready um, to put into nukes 
And then the big swarmy ones, I'm, I'm probably just going to dissolve them completely or take, split them hard. Uh, maybe take them down to two boxes and then run an excluder and a honey super over that. Um, we'll, we'll see on all this. I've got a lot of stuff floating around in my head. I may drive down to Midway Bee Supply tomorrow and pick up the rest of my wooden wear. Uh, he sent me a letter saying that it would be ready on March 18th. Uh, somebody was down there from my bee club and they messaged me on Facebook and said my stuff was ready as well. But this weather and everything I've had going on, I've not had a chance to get down there. I might be able to run down there in the morning though. And then I've got to get the dip tank fired back up. I've actually got some equipment for a couple of other guys I've got to get dipped. And then I've got to get through the rest of my stuff. And after I get through this first round of wax dipping, you know, with this new equipment I've got coming in, I think I've got almost 300 medium boxes uh, supposed to be here. So I've got to get all of those assembled and then get them dipped. I've still got uh, 105 bottom boards sitting over there. I've got to get wax dipped. So got a lot of work coming up in the next couple of weeks. A lot of work. All right, so question and answer this week. I've got a couple questions. The first one comes from Woodland Harvest Honey Company. Uh, I'm going to pick on the second part of this. He says, also on the thing on people not ordering as much honey, I have my honey in a local grocery store that was selling great. The store moved the location of my honey and sales really fell off. Question mark. So this is in regards to me saying on last week's video that I think you sell more from a full table than you do from an empty table. Uh, I'd seen a fall off in orders when I let my wholesale customers know that I was close to running out of honey. So they come back and, or and order less. The same phenomenon you can see at a festival. If you've got an almost empty table, people just don't want to take your last bottle of honey. But if you've got a full table, a nice looking display that's absolutely chock full, they'll buy as much as they want. So this is sort of interesting. I, I was actually a retail buyer, worked in a retail store for four years, and the store owner, this was a small outdoor store, an independent outdoor store, and the store owner had been there 38 or nine years, and a um, really good guy. So I learned while I was working there that there's really four P's uh, to marketing and retail. And it's, it works out like an equation. So you've got the product, the place, the presentation, and that equals the price that you can get. Uh, it also equals your turnover or the, the amount of turns that you get, how quickly you turn that inventory. And if you extrapolate this to honey, you know, the product, have you got just a generic wildflower that's got some, uh, some gur in it? Or have you got a really nice varietal that you can label as a varietal? Or is, have you got ultra local honey, raw honey? Um, is it a better product? Is it a differentiated product? Or is it just some homogenous product? So the place that you sell it, uh, probably my biggest wholesaler has a small stand of honey at the checkout. Uh, it's a, actually a pharmacy and everybody that goes there is standing within three feet of this honey display while they buy their medicine. And it's obvious, you know, the place matters. Everybody's going to see that. Almost everybody's going to notice it. Everybody's got a chance to buy it. Bob Benny, when I was meeting with him, he told me that if you can get your own display in a grocery store, that your sales will triple or quadruple. Yeah, first of all, we provide the racks for free. Mm -hmm. Anytime you can put one of these in a store uh, and not be on the shelf with all the other honeys, your sales are gonna go up four, five, six, eight times. These racks, uh, we've got several hundred of these out there in the field and they, they're running us about $200 a piece. You can see, even though this one's dirty and needs to be refurbished, this mm -hmm. is a pretty nice rack. Yeah. We'll clean it up and send it back out. And uh, it's, it's well worth the investment to put these out. And this rack is a little bit misleading. It holds a lot of honey. You can put $800 of honey on this rack right <laughs> here, wholesale cost. And yeah, when they get down about half full, then they refill them and you got three or $400 going onto the rack. 
if we can go into a store for three hundred or four hundred dollars, we're happy. I don't like going into a store for fifty-two dollars. That's yeah. not profitable enough. So, uh, yeah. Presentation. So if you've got an also ran looking bottle with a sort of a busy or undistinguishable label standing next to a bottle that looks really smart, really bold, um, that stands out, this one, the really good looking presentation is going to far outsell the other presentation. So that that's just how it is. You know, it's worth working with a graphic designer. Uh, if you've got some ideas on how you want your labels to look and how you want your bottles to look, if you can make those look a little different from everybody else and make them catch the eye, they've got to pop, they've got to stand out if you're in a retail setting. Now, there's a lot of very successful beekeepers who just sell in quart and pint jars and they've been doing it that way for 40 or 50 years. And that's great, but they've been doing it that way 40 or 50 years. So the grassroots word of mouth is how they're selling honey. Um, if you're going into a, a retail store, then you really need to think about selling to that customer the first time. You know, it's a customer acquisition cost. If I can get honey in their mouth that first time, probably an 80% likelihood they're gonna reorder for me, from me. So if I can sell to them the first time, I gain a customer for life. That's the way I look at it. So I've got to get that initial sale. How do I do that? Presentation is a, a strong part of that. The final part of the equation is price. I think the first three added together uh, give you the price that you can charge. Um, I think I could probably charge a little bit more than I do. I'm charging roughly 14 a pound now. I think I could do a little bit more than that, but I don't want to. You know, I want to be fair and uh, put out a good product at a fair price. So, you know, Bob Benny always tells me that you can sell less for more or more for less, and, and he tries to hit the middle ground on that. I think I'm sort of shooting for a little bit above the middle ground, uh, you know, premium product, premium honey, but not some outlandish uh, Savannah Bee Company type pricing structure. So second question this week does not come from one of the recent videos. It actually came, on, came in on one of my honey extraction videos about my honey house. And uh, I was talking about how I was drying honey supers out with uh, low humidity in the building and then putting fans on top of the supers and blowing um, hot dry air through them. I've got a question from David Cassidy. He says, do you have issues with small hive beetle larvae on your supers that you are drying? I've been told to extract supers in one to two days after removal from hive. I would agree with that most of the time. Um, if you are extract, if you're pulling supers off of hives, you probably need to extract within a day or two. But, and there is a but, I've basically got a drying room. Uh, I can suck the humidity in my honey house down to 30% or below. I can get the temperature up to about 90 degrees and I can blow a lot of air through my stacks of supers. I'm trying to figure out how to word this, but um, if you read Steve Tabor's book, Breeding Super Bees, he talks about how, uh, how with bee, bee larvae and eggs, humidity is much more important in keeping them alive than temperature is. He actually did experiments where he chilled eggs in like 34 degree water in a refrigerator for 24 hours and then put them back in a hive and they actually became bees. They were still viable. but uh, you do the same kind of experiment where you dry them out, lower the humidity, and they die. So if you look at the good queen breeders, queen producers, they always uh, have a grafting environment where the humidity is really high. Usually the temperature is high too, but the humidity has got to be high. So they'll keep a pot of water boiling or heated. Uh, they'll have wet, warm cloths to cover the, the larvae with so that they don't dry out. And, and I think that what is happening in my drying room 
is I am drying out the eggs and larvae of small hive beetles. Now, I asked Bob Benny about this, about his drying room, because he, a lot of times, is using a skateboards to pull his honey. So, he is leaving an escape board on a hive for, say, three days. He'll put three supers on top of an escape board, come back three days later, pull it, take that to his drying room, leave it in there for three days to dry it out. And I asked him, you know, Bob, does, do you not have problems with hive beetles because these, you know, these supers are unattended for up to six days? And he said that he doesn't. He didn't offer any explanation further than that. But I was talking to uh, Mike Barry about this, who also has a YouTube channel that you should check out. I like him a lot. Um, and he said that somebody had told him that airflow and low humidity will dry out and kill high beetle larvae and eggs. So this is not something I can prove, and I don't even know how to design an experiment to test it. I've thought about getting an aquarium and putting a bunch of high beetles in there and just seeing if I can dry them out and kill them with airflow and low humidity. Um, but I, I don't have the time to do everything I need to do. I can't add a bunch of stuff that I just, just want to play around with. Um, but anyway, it's my suspicion, we'll call it that, that I may be killing the eggs and larvae of hive beetles in my drying room. So I think four to six days uh, with a super unattended, you know, two or three days over an escape, three or four days in the drying room, uh, if I'm using fume boards or whatever, I think I'm fine with that. I see hive beetles when I'm extracting, but I don't see any uh, larvae. So channel news. Um, I actually shot the all medium box beekeeping video last week but I had the microphone too close to my collar and it would blow the, the mic. Uh, you know, it would just start clipping and it sounded bad. So then I, I shoot with a, a backup audio source. I've got a, a shotgun mic on the camera here and I was trying to pull that in, but then it doesn't sound as good. So I was compressing it and compressing the compressor and putting limiters on it and all this to try to make it sound good. And then I thought, man, I can just do better than this. So I scrapped the whole thing, said I was going to start over, but I'd done it here at the bench. And the more I think about it, I think I should do some field sections to that. Um, that's a video that I think people should pay attention to, especially new beekeepers getting in. So um, I want to do it justice. And I think I can do that better if I wait a, two or three weeks on it, get some field shots when we've got weather for that maybe make some nukes up and show how I do that and some splits and actually do a show and tell. So I think I'm just going to wait on that one because I, I can make it better. Yeah, so that, that's what I'll do. This will more than likely be the only video that I push out this week. Uh, I've got some random shots and stuff of some stuff I'm working on, but nothing I can get edited and pushed out. Guys, as always, I'm answering a question or two every week. Uh, if you've got questions just leave them in the comments below you can email them to info at duckriverhoney.com and i'll pick one or two that i think are interesting and try to get those answered for you appreciate you watching i'll see you on the next one